Matt Hoffman has already worked on many topics in his life. Music information retrieval, speech enhancement, user behavior modeling, social network analysis, astronomy, you name it. Obviously, picking questions for him was hard. So we ended up talking more or less freely, which is honestly one of my favorite types of episodes. So you'll hear about the circumstances in which Matt would advise picking up Bayesian stats, generalized HMC, blocked samplers, why do the samplers he works on have food-based names, etc. In case you don't know him, Matt is a research scientist at Google. Before that, he did a postdoc in the Columbia Stats Department, working with Andrew Gelman, and a PhD at Princeton, working with David Blay and Perry Cook. Matt is probably best known for his work in approximate Bayesian inference algorithms, such as stochastic variational inference and the no-U-turn sampler, but he's also worked on a wide range of applications and contributed to software such as Stan and TensorFlow Probability. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 78, recorded January 12, 2023. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, for any info about the podcast, learnbasedstats.com is la place to be, show notes, becoming a corporate sponsor, supporting LBS and Patreon, unlocking Bayesian merch, everything is in there. That's learnbasedstats.com. If with all that info, a Bayesian model is still resisting you, or if you find my voice especially smooth and want me to come and teach Bayesian stats in your company, then reach out at alex.endora at pymc-labs.io or book a call with me at learnbasedstats.com. Thanks a lot, folks, and best Bayesian wishes to you all. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Wes Abazian is someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. Abazian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen. Maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming. How would I know unless I'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like I'm Richard Feynman? Hello, my dear Bayesians. Before we hear about Matt, I just wanted to extend my big thank you to Nicholas Rode for joining the LBS Patreon in the Good Bayesian tier. I am so grateful to all of you folks who make the effort of giving the LBS a few dollars every month. And Nicholas, make sure to tweet at us when you receive your exclusive patron merch. Okay, now let's talk with Matt Hoffman. Matt Hoffman, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks a lot for taking the time. I'm really happy to have you on the show. And yeah, your name came up uh, quite sometimes in the Slack of the patrons. So finally, we made it. So I'm sure a lot of listeners are going to be happy when that episode hits the press. Thanks for taking the time. And as usual, let's start with your origin story. And well, basically, tell us how you came to the stats and data world and how sinuous of a path it was. Yeah, well, it was definitely not a uh, not a direct path. I did not, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there are some people I feel like who sort of, you know, in, in high school or whatever, they're like, you know, this is, this is my thing, I'm going to, and then they just go in a straight line towards that thing, often with amazing results. Uh, I was not one of those people. I came to machine learning and statistics through music synthesis actually oh okay and signal processing uh-huh. is as a as an undergrad i was sort of looking for i was i was a cs major and sort of looking for ways to take classes that i was more interested in than the cs class than the many many cs classes that i was uh, that i needed to take and so i uh, this was at columbia and they have this computer music center which it was possible to get sort of elective credits for for taking classes there in, in uh, mm-hmm. this very kind of weird kind of world of academic computer music. And I 
you know, enjoyed that and started doing some independent studies and uh, sort of research projects there, which was kind of enough to get me into grad school doing computer music stuff with uh, with Perry Cook at Princeton. And so I started sort of doing more kind of like synthesis oriented stuff, but also some analysis stuff because I was sort of interested in how those two things could can interact with each other. Mm -hmm. And that sort of got me into this music information retrieval world of, you know, just people trying to analyze music with computers. Mm -hmm. And that in turn, you know, the only thing that really worked there was, of course, machine learning methods, which at the time was kind of news to people that that was, tr you know, that was not at the time. At the time, that was just sort of something people were beginning to realize. Yeah. This would have been in like, you know, 2000, mid 2000s, I would say. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like learned the machine learning stuff well enough to kind of be able to use it a little bit, but not, you know, I, but I definitely also kind of got the the impression from like theoretical machine learning classes that I was like not necessarily smart enough to actually directly contribute to this field. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very fortunate in 2007, in the fourth year of my PhD, uh, right? So like, you know, kind of late in the game, arguably, I kind of on a whim took this Bayesian on parametric seminar from David Bly, who had started at Princeton not long before that. And sort of, you know, things went, uh, yeah, things went from there. So uh, that was sort of my my path to Bayesian statistics was uh, was just kind of being like, you know, oh, well, you know, I've used Gaussian mixtures for stuff before. And maybe there's something interesting about like, you know, this Bayesian non-parametric stuff and and then sort of discovering that that this was actually a thing I could kind of do. Hmm. OK. OK, so basically, yeah, it like it started more on the the musing front and, and then like the methods themselves became kind of your focus and, and the, the statistical side of things. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a pretty gradual process. Mm -hmm. You know, it sort of started with, uh, you know, until like the very last, the last um, year of my PhD, everything I had done was, was focused on some music application. It wasn't until the like online latent Dirichlet allocation stuff that mm, okay. uh, I started looking at something that didn't didn't have an explicit music connection although although I had already kind of gotten interested in LDA as a way of doing source separation for audio and so that begs the questions the question were you in a band at some point of your life Matt I have been in at least one band at some point in my life I knew it I knew it was that band called latent directly allocation it was not no that's a shame because that would be an amazing name. <laughs> I would definitely be in a, if I were in a band, I would name it Latent Uricly Allocation. That sounds amazing. It's not too late. <laughs> so for listeners who don't have the video, I don't think Matt is approving of my name of band, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> cool. And so, so yeah, okay. Thanks. Like you, you actually answered the second question I wanted to ask you, which is like, if you remember how you first got introduced to Bayesian methods, methods, but seems like you do. I mean, today, how frequently do you use them? Because you work a lot on algorithms, but kind of an irony I found when recording all these podcasts is that usually the people who work on the algorithms don't work a lot on models. And so in the end, they don't use a lot of Bayesian models, but they are designing the algorithms that everybody's using in the Bayesian world. So what about you? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? That's I, I feel like that's, I mean, that's what we always you know, have, have said is one of the strengths of the paradigm, right? Is that we can separate modeling and inference mm -hmm. and actually have this separation of concerns. So, you know, to the extent that that's true, I guess that's like the system maybe working as intended. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, as far as, you know, applied work is concerned, you know, whatever works, I guess. I don't do a ton of kind of uh, sort of first author style, like uh, like applied work on my own these days. But I don't know. I mean, I try and only work on things where my expertise is actually relevant. That's kind of a, um, a luxury to working at a, an organization as large as Google is that they, you know, they have other people who can do the, the other stuff. Hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, pretty much it's pretty rare for me to work on something that doesn't have some probabilistic modeling component to it because you know, somebody else can probably do that better than I can. So, yeah, I don't know if that fully answers your question. I guess as far as like the sort of Bayesian versus non-Bayesian or, you know, like point estimates versus like full posteriors are, is concerned or, you know, something in the middle like variational inference. Again, you know, I think whatever works, right? It just depends on what the task really calls for and kind of what the computational limitations are. But, but yeah, I mean, I like, I like problems where there's actually 
a good reason to be properly, if not Bayesian kind of at every level, right? Then, you know, maybe you're like fitting a point estimate to, you know, doing an empirical Bayes thing to, to get a prior, you know, fitting that to a bunch of data, but, but also, but you're, you know, hopefully doing something interesting at the, doing some kind of, you've got some kind of interesting inference problem where there's actually some good reason to solve the inference problem. Yeah. And that's, I mean, in any case, it's interesting for, for listeners to know where you come from and also what you're doing day to day because it's going to inform everything we're going to talk about a bit later where we're going to dive into a bit more technical things. And so actually, can you define the work you're doing nowadays for people to give them an idea and also uh, the topics that you are particularly interested in? Yeah. So the last few years, something I've been very interested in is MCMC methods that can take advantage of hardware acceleration in a in a kind of meaningful way. So, uh, you know, in particular GPUs or, or TPUs are, of course, what we like to use at Google when possible. So, you know, I've been very interested in sort of this hypothesis that there is an interesting class of MCMC workflows that this hardware and software, uh, the software that, you know, makes it relatively easy to, to do MCMC on these, on these devices, that basically running a lot of chains in parallel independently, you know, has, has real value, right? As opposed to the more traditional kind of workflow where you're running like one to four longer chains of your MCMC procedure, mm -hmm. you know, hoping that they have low enough autocorrelation that you can actually get a reasonable estimate out of those chains. You know, the hope is that by running a bunch of chains in parallel, all you have to wait for is for them to warm up and forget their bias and get rid of their bias. And then you can let the, the parallelism handle the variance for you. And then you get a good, a good enough estimate, right? And the, the number I like to sort of throw around there is, is that 50 chains should probably be about enough for most posterior expectations that you might want to estimate because past that, you're getting more and more accurate estimates of the posterior expectation, but who cares about the posterior expectation, right? Because obviously we're doing Bayesian statistics and we believe that we can't actually pin these things down to an infinite level of precision given a finite amount of data. So that's sort of one, one line that we've been looking at is sort of like, you know, diagnostics and algorithms that, uh, that make sense in that context, you know, and, and I think one of the things that motivates that is kind of lessons learned maybe from the deep learning revolution of the early 2010s that like, you know, I had sort of not really been all that interested in systems and sort of been like, you know, well, we should be able to do everything on a laptop. And I think, you know, the deep learning people really showed that you kind of ignore progress in the systems world to your peril, right? That like none of that stuff, none of that stuff would be possible without these amazing hardware and software systems that you know, have made progress over the last 20 years in a way that that CPUs really haven't. And so, you know, I think that's kind of uh, one kind of guiding principle is just like, you know, pay attention to what the systems are doing, because if you don't, then somebody else is going to come up with a method that actually takes advantage of the enormous computational power that we have now, and you're going to look less and less relevant. And um, that was kind of the, the thinking there. Mm. But yeah, other thing, other topics I've been interested in recently, I'm starting to get interested in sequential Monte Carlo. And, you know, that's sort of like a natural, in some sense, that's sort of a natural next step from this many chain MCMC world. And it, you know, has some interesting, possibly some interesting advantages, uh, you know, in particular, you know, handling multimodality more robustly. And, uh, you know, maybe you can get better diagnostics out of it if you if you pay attention to them. There's also the marginal likelihood thing, which you know ties into variational inference kinds of stories. I tend to be a little bit skeptical of some of the Bayesian model comparison stuff that people use model marginal likelihoods for, for um, you know all the reasons that uh, people like Andrew Gelman and Radford Neal and others have have been you know pointing out over the years sensitivity to, to prior misspecification and that sort of thing. But you know I do think that there are interesting applications for for these things in like pseudo marginal MCMC methods and and things like that. I think there are also costs that you know like there's something nice about how MCMC is just sort of saying like I'm going to run this Markov chain and like I'm not going to be able to tell you if it's actually working. But in exchange for that, I get to not worry about so much stuff and not like have to do so much work with reverse kernels and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that's an interesting kind of uh, dichotomy to study. Yeah. And then the other kind of thread that I've been thinking about more recently is, uh, is Bayesian neural nets, which I think, you know, in some ways have some interesting, you know, in some ways I think are sort of like, in some ways I are, are sort of a pipe dream. And I think uh, have 
I have historically been very skeptical of a lot of the Bayesian neural net stuff, but I get less skeptical. I've been getting less skeptical. I think, you know, actually there are situations where we actually can make these things work and not just the like, you know, kind of absurd thing we did a, a couple of years ago with like running um, a, like ResNet on 512 TPU cores to like fit a CVAR 10 model that was like pretty good. You know, that's like not a practical application, but um, but we just uh, we just put a paper out um, on something we call uh, PropNerf, which is like using these uh, neural radio, sort of a Bayesian neural, neural radiance field kind of thing that lets you infer a 3D model uh, from 2D image with uncertainty, right? So if you have a, a picture of somebody and you don't get to observe kind of exactly what their left arm is doing, it'll the posterior will will respect that uncertainty and give you samples that have different uh, different poses. So I think there's you know I think there's interesting things that you can do with the with that sort of Bayesian neural net type approach. It is expensive, but you know figuring out how to make expensive things less expensive is um, is the job. Yeah, I say it's kind of the tagline of Bayesian stats. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for, for all those beats. Like, uh, I want to <laughs> kind of want to dive into into all of that, but uh, we'll we'll see. We have time. Definitely, something I I want to ask you is when I started preparing for this episode, I, I saw that you've worked already on like so many topics in your life. As you were saying, like you were music information retrieval, but also you did some work on speech enhancement and user behavior modeling, social network analysis, on astronomy even. I'm wondering what's the common, is there a common interest that unites all of those fields? Uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, like interestingness, I guess, right? This is sort of like, you know, I think this is one of the nice things about working in a kind of foundational technology like machine learning or statistics, right? Is that um, you can actually contribute something to fields that you don't actually have a ton of expertise in. And so mm -hmm. you get to kind of, you know, be a dilettante and, and dabble in different things without actually, you know, well, actually, you know, hopefully actually doing something useful. So I think that's, uh, there's a lot of interesting things in the world. And so, you know, the, I guess the common thread is just like, is there, is there something that I think I could do here? Yeah. So yeah, I don't, yeah other than that, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're, you're a curious person. That that's also why you did so many things, I guess. Yeah, uh, fair enough. I, I think that's fair. <laughs> and also, obviously, you're a co-founder of Stan. So I'm curious, and, and you, you talked a bit about that already, but it's a question I often have as, I, don't, I mean, through the podcast, but also a lot through PyMC Labs, our consultancy, and a lot through the workshops and teachings I do, is... For which problems or in which circumstances would you advise someone to pick up Stan and Bayesian stats? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, there are obvious, obvious cases, which is like, you know that you need to do some statistics to like, mm -hmm. you know, you gathered some data and you know you have to do some statistics on it. And like an off the shelf, you know, closed form package isn't, isn't going to work for some reason. That's kind of a, a vacuous answer, I guess, in some ways. But, you know, I think the larger question is sort of like, you know, what, when do you actually need to do fully Bayesian inference in a, in a, like an interesting model? I think the answer that I, I sort of gravitate towards is decision problems, right? So like, I'm not like a, you know, religious Bayesian, right? I'm not, I, I, I think sort of ontologically, the, the ontological status of like subjective probabilities is a thing that feels a little slippery to me, mm -hmm. but you know, I think the Bayesian decision theory story is, is simple and rock solid, right? Like if you want to make decisions that lead to good outcomes, then you have to maximize your expected utility under some distribution over possible with respect to your degrees of belief. I think those are the tasks. If you, if you look at where Bayesian methods are really useful, right? Those are the, those are the situations is, is where they're tied to some decision-making mm -hmm. task mm -hmm. much more, I think, than like, you know, just somehow getting a better point estimate or something like that. I could be convinced that there are situations or there will be that people will find ways to make the, the Bayesian framework really, really pay off that don't have that flavor where it's just about sort of being right. But it feels like a less obvious argument to me than just like, you know, you need to, you, you have some data and you want to use that data to make better, 
better decisions. That to me is what is is the clearest, at least the clearest use case for Bayesian methods. Yeah, I like that. And I mean, also in my experience, some people come to the the Bayesian framework with you know the episto epistemological hat, but the vast majority of people come there from the practicality standpoint. Whereas, like especially in the research area, where it's like, well, basically, base help me do what I wanted to do way more easily. And then yeah. I understood the ramifications and why it's justified. And I found that interesting, but that was not my main motivation to start with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, yeah, again, right, it's the separation of concerns thing to some degree, right? That mm -hmm. like you can say, rather than trying to design an algorithm that's going to do the thing that you want it to do, mm -hmm. you can write down some, assu some assumptions and, you know, trust that there is some possibility, at least, that an algorithm can be found that will take those assumptions and, and give you a, a reasonable answer. Obviously, there are a lot of caveats on that little uh, on that little fairy tale. And, you know, I also think, right, like I work at Google, we talk about deep learning an awful lot. And deep learning has, you know, also logged some enormous successes, uh, I think, for a lot of the same kinds of reasons, right? The separation of modeling and algorithms, right? That like, mm -hmm. you know, the way you do deep learning, right? Is you construct a function and then you optimize it with stochastic gradient descent. And like, you know, that's also been a very, very successful paradigm, I think for very much the same reasons. It's just that the, the paradigm there is I have inputs and outputs and I would like a machine that gives me the right outputs. And it's sort of less clear how to make it work in situation in situations where what you really want is uh, is something with a little more causal structure. Okay, yeah, yeah, I see. Super interesting. Yeah, I'll definitely think about that. Also, it's it's gonna help me answer these kind of questions. <laughs> Thanks for letting me pick your brain. Let's get a bit more technical now, because that's also why I inv invited you. In so, if I remember correctly, in your meets paper, so that's spelled. M E A D S for listeners, and we'll definitely put that paper in the show notes. You use generalized HMC, so Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So, can you give us the gist and tell us if you think that for you it's really one of the main future avenue for HMC? Sure. You know, generalized HMC is is this thing that's been around for for quite a long time now. Um, it came out not very, you know, just a few years after the original hybrid Monte Carlo paper, and basically the generalization is in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, right, you alternate between resampling some momentum variables that correspond to your variables that you actually want to do inference on and simulating the some Hamiltonian dynamics where the you have a potential energy function that's given by your negative log posterior, negative log joint, same thing, mm -hmm. up to a constant. And... Um, uh, right, so you simulate those dynamics, and if you do it well, then the energy doesn't, the total energy doesn't change, and so you're you're able to, and it's reversible, and everything is, it's this very beautiful, very elegant kind of way of solving the the problem of moving around efficiently in high dimensions. That's sort of classic hybrid Monte Carlo. You alternate between you resample your momentum, that's a Gibbs step, and you do this this Hamiltonian dynamics update, which uh, is the 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 heart at the heart of the algorithm, and sort of mixes sort of mixes entropy between these refreshed momenta and the, the position variables, which are the things you care about. Generalized HMC, kind of big idea, is to not completely update the momentum variables, but instead to essentially damp them and then replace the sort of, and then sort of make up for that contraction with, uh, by, by adding some additional Gaussian noise. So this looks like sort of, sort of in, physics sen in a physics sense, right? It's as though you introduced some friction is a pretty good way to think about it, right? That you have a particle that is undergoing, uh, that has mass, and so, you know, momentum, therefore, and it's being banged around by some Brownian motion, and there's also some, fr some friction that kind of makes up for the uh, for the additional energy that's coming in in the form of that Brownian motion. And so it has the sort of like underdamped Langevin equation kind of feel to it if you, uh, if you only take one step, uh, only take sort of, you know, a, a small, only simulate for a small period of time before partially refreshing this momentum. So what's nice about it is that it does have this sort of cute, like, you know, continuous time limit that looks like an underdamped Langevin equation. And that's a nice sort of intuitive physics-y thing that uh, is actually, that's also like a lot easier to do theory on than this kind of alternating Gibbs-flavored thing. 
So like if you look in the literature, there's way more theory about convergence of underdamped Langevin methods than there is about HMC. But uh, again, because this continuous time limit is sort of available to work with in a way that it's sort of harder to, to think about with HMC, vanilla HMC. You know, the big downside for generalized HMC and the reason it hasn't been more widely used in practice is that it exposes you to kind of this gauntlet of accept-reject steps where after every one of these updates, there is a chance that you will reject and you can, you know, there's a straightforward kind of Jensen's inequality argument that uh, that shows that this can be actually quite a big penalty. And so you wind up needing to use very small step sizes and it's uh, it's just not practical unless you do something like the slice sampling trick that Radford Neal introduced a few years ago, which as one might expect is, you know, elegant and clever and the sort of thing that, uh, you know, somebody should have thought of a long time ago. But, you know, that's why he's right for deal is that he makes it look obvious in hindsight. <laughs> I should say, you know, there's also another strategy, which is uh, what uh, what Josh uh, Sol Dickstein called the look ahead HMC strategy, which is also kind of you can also sort of interpret in through a slice sampling lens. So basically, that's what we sort of built on in the Meads paper was this innovation that made it possible to use generalized HMC without this horrible rejection behavior. And so, OK, so that's sort of what the, that's sort of the what and now like, yeah. what's the why yeah i mean one answer is just was there to be done and it seemed like we could do something interesting mm-hmm. it's not a good enough answer but it's well it can be a good enough answer i guess i think practically speaking there it's not really obvious to me that one method dominates the other i think there will be situations where it makes sense to use one there will be situations where it makes sense to use the other but i don't think it's like a you know like we're never going to use the sort of classic full momentum refreshment HMC. I think there are, you know, anything, I would say probably almost anything you can do in one framework, you can probably get to work in the other. It just might be more or less convenient from a kind of derivation and coding perspective. One possible application for the generalized HMC strategy uh, uh, that, you know, it's something it really does make easier to do than, um, or, you know, that, that something that, is sort of an affordance that I think you don't get with uh, with classic HMC is the ability to more frequently interleave Gibbs updates for some variables, for example, discrete variables that might not be natural to update with with HMC, right? So I would, in general, I would never, maybe not never, but I, I would, it's hard for me to think of a situation where I would advocate doing HMC kind of alternating between some variables and some other variables, right? Sort of an HMC within Gibbs kind of thing, I would usually rather do HMC on everything jointly because otherwise, you know, that's sort of the whole point of HMC is that you're suppressing random walk behavior. And if you're doing something that looks like Gibbs, you're going to get random walk behavior. So you're sort of missing the point. There could be situations, you know, there could be situations where there are computational reasons. It's much cheaper to update one set of variables or something. I think in that kind of situation, I would usually rather put that logic into the integrator itself rather than doing some Hamiltonian splitting thing, rather than kind of an outer outer loop kind of thing. But, you know, the point is that uh, with discrete variables, that's not so much of an option, right? The, the, the ways to integrate discrete variables into HMC are, they exist, but they're definitely not, not perfect. So a thing you can do, and this is something that Radford mentioned in, in his 2020 paper, is you could alternate every gradient step with doing Gibbs updates on some discrete things, for example, which I think is a potentially interesting move. I think you do in that situation, my intuition is that in that situation, you do still have to be careful about random walk behavior, right? Because basically there's now there's all this Gibbs noise that might interfere with the the sort of the coherence of the the sort of momentum acceleration that you get in generalized HMC. And so to kind of keep that nice momentum, coherent momentum kind of explore based exploration, you might need to use a pretty small step size so that you're essentially averaging away that Gibbs noise. Right. So you're like now you're you're getting sort of I guess the way to the way that I think about it is if you have a random value for your discrete variable, your set your discrete variables, that's giving you, you know, that's like the expected gradient that you would get with respect to the conditional for those discrete variables given your continuous state, um, which is the, the gradient that you that you want, plus some noise. And that noise is going to kind of bounce you around and might come to make you forget your momentum faster than you want to. But if you take smaller steps uh, and update 
those discrete variables more frequently, then essentially you, you're still getting this random noise, but you're, uh, you're, you know, if you take 10 steps with one tenth the step size, there's sort of a continuous limit where that looks a lot like uh, averaging 10 of these independent gradients and getting rid of uh, a bunch of the noise that way. Now, of course, that, you know, might get expensive and, and it sort of starts to shade into something that looks a little bit like a pseudo marginal MCMC kind of strategy. So that's sort of like a, a theme, right? Kind of the longer I think about these things, the more it feels as though, you know, the, the design space is not as big as it looks in some sense, right? There's sort of like we have a relatively small number of strategies for for solving various kinds of problems. And they might kind of be derived very differently and kind of look different in the way that you implement them. But if you kind of take a step back and look at them from the right perspective, they're still kind of exploiting the same levers and wind up having similar scaling behavior and there winds up being, you know, no free lunch, basically. That's uh, obviously a bit hand wavy. So the, I guess the answer to your question is, I think there are some interesting affordances that uh, the generalized HMC offers. And also, you know, just from a coding perspective, it it may be nicer or less nice in some frameworks, but I don't think it, you know, dominates the the classic full momentum refreshment strategy necessarily. So in your mind, it's more something that's that's complementary than that's than something that's gonna be able to take over what you already have. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's uh it's just another another part of the design space. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay. Are you already able to say in which cases that will be more interesting than the current nuts sampling? The nuts. I'm taking nuts as a, as a baseline because it's it's what yeah. Stan uses by default and PyMC. And- right. Right. Well, so, you know, I think one nice thing about Meads is that because it's sort of in this many chain, you know, I was sort of talking about generalized HMC, but Meads, uh, the point, of, the real contribution in Meads is the the automatic tuning strategy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, I, that I'm, I'm pretty pretty optimistic about under certain circumstances. So one nice thing about Meads is that it lets you do adaptation of the things we like to adapt, like number of um, like step size and preconditioning and mm-hmm. uh, the damping parameter for generalized HMC, which is analogous to the, serves a similar role to the number of leapfrog steps parameter that uh, vanilla HMC that Nuts was designed to get rid of. So Meads offers a way, offers ways of tuning all of these things in a way that Still preserves detailed balance and uh, and keeps the the target distribution invariant. So that's nice. You know, I think I'm not that worried about kind of the bias that comes from step size adaptation and and to some extent preconditioner adaptation um, from doing that during warm up, especially if you have a fair number of chains to average the to average that adaptation signal over. You know, I don't think that bias is huge in practice, and I think you can get rid of it pretty quickly by taking by, by freezing and taking a few extra steps. But you know, there could be situations where you want to use it as part of a uh, a larger procedure where you really don't want to do that warm up thing. It just is like unwieldy for some reason. So I think that could be interesting. Or you might, you know, it's it's also just nice to not have to worry about it. Situations where I don't think it's going to work is, you know, it's, I think if you have serious multimodality that could very easily break it because it is really assuming that you know it's assuming that the same step size and damping parameter and preconditioner are appropriate for all of your chains and if that's not true then you know it's going to have to make some kind of compromise that's not necessarily going to be the compromise that you want so nuts at least in principle if you ran multiple nuts chains in parallel and they found different modes then that had different scales and wanted different numbers of leapfrog steps in principle nuts could do that if you're in that situation, you might have other problems, but at least, you know, I think probably for robustness, Nuts is still going to win. But, you know, Nuts is not not a simple algorithm to implement and has a lot of control flow and sort of ragged computation that make it kind of, that introduce a lot of overhead when you're trying to run it on the kind of SIMD hardware that, that we like these days, like GPUs. And also Nuts does waste a certain number of gradient steps in satisfying detailed balance because it has to do this forward and backward exploration and it's going to wind up choosing a state to move to that is it's going to wind up exploring states and computing gradients at states that are not on the path between the initial state and the state that you wind up moving to so on average that's going to be about a factor of two inefficiency that you get uh, that you get with nuts some of which you you know if you really had enough parallel computation you could probably get that down by some factor with speculative ex- speculative execution and stuff like that but eh. You know, it's messy. I see. Okay. 
Nice. I mean, yeah, and like the fact that we have we're starting to have all that diversity of of algorithm is actually super cool because then like you can definitely envision that there are some types of models that are gonna sample better with that kind of algorithms and then another one with an another type. And ideally I would love Stan and Pime Scene and so on to see that automatically in a way. And then I just well, if yeah, I don't know, you're fitting that kind of model, we're using nuts, nuts and then oh you're fitting that kind of model, we're gonna use meads and the user doesn't have to worry about that. Uh, because then yeah. as you say, we enforce the separation of inference and algorithms. Yeah. Or you know, you have multiple computers. Try it both ways. Yes. But I mean, that would work for you and me, but I'm I'm, I'm like for the people who don't really know a lot about the theory. And that would add to the barrier. And so here I'm thinking about the people like basically lowering the barrier to entry and making the workflow easier to use. Mm -hmm. That would be like yeah. abstracting that difficulty out, I guess. Because otherwise it's even more overwhelming. Of course, of course. Yeah. No, I mean you would want that to be something if yeah, in general, you know, ideally we would also have diagnostics, right? That yeah. that would a lot that would at least make it possible to to automate some of that stuff. Mm. And I do wanna along those lines just plug uh some recent work that uh, Charles Margosian uh, and I and other people, a number of other people, uh, have uh, have done recently on on a mini chain diagnostic called nested R hat, um, which is uh, meant to you know hopefully get us these uh, these kind of diagnostic results a little a little faster than classical diagnostics would. I do think that you know better diagnostics are really an important part of the workflow, even though you know they're not necessarily something that I have gotten a ton of maybe the same level of attention as as sort of new algorithms yeah. have from the yeah, community. For sure. Yeah. And you do need good algorithms first to have the diagnostics because you're in the diagnostics on the, on the algorithms. You, yeah, you need something to diagnose for sure. But, exactly, uh, yeah. So wh what would that nested R hat do? Like, is that is that a like, diagnostic that would compare different samplers or it's still in the sampler and it then compares the chains uh, basically, so at a high level, right, what it's trying to do, so you've got class, you know, classic R hat, which basically takes some chains and looks at the um, the variance of your estimates within a chain versus the variance of your estimates across chains, and you know asks, are those similar? And the assumption is that the within chain variance is going to be, well, not just an assumption. I mean, it's the law of total variance. The the within chain variance is going to. But just intuitively, right, you, you'd expect the within-chain variance to be smaller because if you don't have good convergence, then things aren't moving around and, and you don't have the kind of diversity that leads to variance, uh, to, to higher variances. A nested R hat, the idea is we sort of combine, we assume we have a bunch of chains, we combine them into uh, what we call super chains, which are all initialized at the same point or near the same point. Right, so again, to the extent that they are doing a good job of forgetting their initialization, we should expect them all to converge. We should expect it to be hard to kind of tell the difference between super chains in terms of the variance, right? The variance, uh, you know, it's, right. So we have a bunch of chains all initialized from the same position. If they haven't fully converged yet, then we would expect the variance estimates that we get from that set of chains to be small relative to the variance that we would get by looking at a bunch of different initializations, right? There's like a component of the variance that's due to initialization and a component that's due to exploration. We expect that initialization component to get smaller, relatively smaller, as uh, as the procedure forgets, because it needs to forget its initialization. So that's kind of the high-level idea, basically, right? Is instead of looking at individual chains, we look at these sort of super chains. But because we are running many chains within each super chain, we get a, a nice variance reduction in our estimates. And so we don't actually have to run each chain for long enough that we can get high accuracy estimates of the variance of the sort of the amount of variance that's due to initialization. So the idea is that you could run, because the whole point of this many chain workflow is to run enough chains that you don't have to run your chains for a real, any of your chains for a really long time. But with classic R hat, you kind of, you still, to get it to sign off on your results, you still have to run all of your chains for a long time. So that's the idea behind nested R hat is to, to hopefully kind of get somewhat reliable. You know, I mean, obviously there are no, no diagnostic is perfect. These are all just screens, but uh, but somewhat reliable signals of, of convergence or non-convergence fast, as opposed to, you know, like when, when it actually happens, right? Convergence in the sense of low bias, when it actually happens, as opposed to once it's happened and also we've run for long enough that each chain, the estimates for each chain has low variance. I see, okay. Yeah, so 
definitely that kind of those diagnostics would yeah would help for like adoption and understanding of those new samplers that's for sure yeah okay i see but i mean also for you know i i do want to push back a little bit against kind of uh you know you, you said sort of for for adoption and, and usage right which kind of suggests maybe like less sophisticated users but i do which is a thing that we you know we all we say all the time right that like you know we do this uh automated you know we build these automated systems and you know adaptive methods and and so on and so forth and and even diagnostics right you know part of the story is about making these workflows available to less sophisticated users which is obviously like super important and and absolutely a good enough reason to do it but as somebody who would not describe himself necessarily as a novice user right i still really 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 like not having to tune these things by hand it's just such a pain when we were writing the cheese paper doing the experiments for that i was like oh right ugh like now i've got to run all these experiments where it's like, you know, the experiments for cheese, where we evaluated cheese, that was easy, right? Because it was just like, you just run it once. The experiments where we do a grid search over all of the other parameters, that was a pain, right? And so it's like, there's this phrase that I feel like comes up often that I think, you know, certainly I've used it any number of times, and I think I probably stole it from somewhere, which is tedious and error prone, right? That like, you know, we talk about like, manually computing derivatives is tedious and error prone, manually tuning the parameters of your sampler is tedious and error prone. And it just, you know, it is. It, and that's true whether you're a novice. It's certainly true if you're a novice. Like the, it's certainly true if you're a novice, but it's it's true if you're a sophisticated user too. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. I mean, for me, for instance, who is not going from a ba- math background, having the ability to rely on, on those automated samplers is just like really incredible because then I can focus on the code instead of focusing on the math. And uh, it's just like invaluable because it unlocks a lot of possibilities. And also it unlocks those exact miles for people who would otherwise not be able to use them. And so it's it's incredibly valuable for sure. Yeah. And actually, I have at least another technical question for you, but also I'm curious a bit more generally because you started talking about that a bit. What do you think are the biggest hurdles right now in the Bayesian workflow? Oh, you know, modeling, inference, <laughs> data, <laughs> like all of it. You know, probably, right, data science is uh, is more data than science, right? Like everybody, you know, if you actually want to solve a problem, then like all the modeling and algorithm stuff is great and important, but, you know, it's not a substitute for better data, right? Like. I'll take better measurements over better modeling any day. But yeah, I mean, I think like, yeah, it feels like there's still just a lot of friction. You know, you sort of, you can build a simple model and fit a simple model to your data and that's fine. That usually works. And sometimes that's enough. Often that's enough. And when it's not, I feel like it feels like things get harder kind of super linearly with the complexity of the model you want to fit. And I think the computation also has a tendency to get super linear in the amount of data that you have, right? So for particularly like, um, you know, I think a big category of, of problems is these underspecified models where there are some degrees of freedom that are very tightly constrained by the data and some that aren't constrained by the data at all, at all and you're really just uh, falling back on your prior, right? And so in those situations, right, the uh, kind of, for HMC at least, right, the distance you have to travel is not going down with the amount of data, but the amount to which you're tightly constrained degrees of freedom are constrained is going down as kind of the square root of the amount of data. And so that means your step size has to go down with the square root of the amount of data, which means your number of steps for HMC has to go up with the square root of the amount of data, which means that your scaling is like n to the one and a half instead of n. So that's like, you know, there's that super linear cost that comes up. There's, uh, and then there's like just the fact, like as you, yeah, just for whatever reason, it, it feels just really, it feels like we should be seeing more complicated models, like more models that are complicated, solving really hard problems than we do. The reason for that is that there is some interaction between model complexity and difficulty of inference that we don't fully know how to solve yet. And, you know, in part, I think that's a workflow thing that like need to do a better job of kind of figuring out what the best practices are for coming up with and fitting more complicated models as we go and sort of uh, having that be kind of an incremental process. And in part, it's probably an algorithms thing that the algorithms that work well for the problems that we 
you know, there's there's sort of a chicken and egg thing, right? Which is that the problems that we study are the problems that we know how to solve, right? Like the models that are out there that we tune all of our algorithms on are the models that have been successful, not the models that have failed. Those just, you know, have a there's a file drawer effect. So I don't know. I mean, I don't have, yeah, I don't know what the answer is. I think that issue of like, you know, there's this ideal picture of like, I am going to get a continuing reward for injecting, for, for building a more and more realistic model. And in practice, it just seems like we hit a wall with that usually. So sort of scaling up modeling complexity. Oh, and I, yeah, right. And part of that is of course priors, right? That like for simple models, it's much easier to specify priors that won't have too much of an effect. But the more complicated your model becomes, the more important it is that your prior actually means something and, and have and, and be reasonable. And constructing reasonable priors is hard work. So I don't know. I just want it all to be easier, I guess, is the answer. But, <laughs> uh, but that's not much of an answer. That wasn't really the question. Like The question was, what do you feel? What do you feel is hard? So and that we should, as a community, try strive to improve. So. Uh, definitely, that's super interesting. So time is flying by, but I really want to ask you that that technical question that comes from my friend and, and fellow PyMC developer, Luciano Pass. And he basically wanted to have your opinion on the blocked samplers. So the idea of mixing, mixing H HMC steps with Gibbs steps and how GHMC comes into play there. So yeah, I, I touched on this a bit before, right? So I think... Like that is a nice affordance of GHMC versus vanilla HMC is that you can interleave these other Gibbs updates more frequently than you can with, with conventional HMC. So I think it's an interesting degree of freedom that I have played around with a little bit on toy problems to just get some intuitions for. I think that it's definitely not a substitute for, there's a point at which it sort of starts to look a bit like a pseudo marginal MCMC method, where essentially this, if you're doing these Gibbs updates frequently enough, then at some point that looks very similar to doing HMC on the marginal marginal distribution of the of the parameters that you're interested in, and so kind of having another way of uh, achieving that, I think, is is an interesting point in the design space. But you know how competitive it is with the other alternatives that there are for doing that, I'm, I'm not totally sure, right? I think that there is, I think if you do those updates too rarely, you're going to wind up with random walk behavior. And I think if you do them too frequently, you're going to wind up paying more than you need to. And hopefully, I guess what I would hope is that there's a reasonably, there's a range of step sizes, essentially, of, of sort of like frequencies with which you're doing these Gibbs updates that where it doesn't matter much, where essentially you're sort of trading off random walk behavior and additional computation in a way that makes it not that important exactly where you wind up on that efficient frontier. Which is, I think, sort of similar to what you see with like uh, parallel tempering, where you use the, the even odd swap strategy, right? The, the idea is that this is a, a method that's meant to make it easier, right? So here you have a bunch of chains, there are different temperatures, and you want to, uh, and you're swapping the states between the chains. And you can do that in a random way or a deterministic way. Uh, and if you do it in a deterministic way, it's possible to get information from kind of the high temperature chains to the low temperature chains without this kind of weird random walk bubble sort like kind of behavior. But the price you pay for that is that if you want it to, to actually make it from the top to the bottom, then you need to use more temperatures, right? And so it sort of winds up being like the same kind of complexity, but at least there's kind of a range of, you're, you're a little less sensitive to kind of getting one of these parameters right. That's what I would hope you could achieve with this. It would be nice if you could achieve more than that, but at least I would hope you could achieve that. Yeah. Okay. I see. Nice. Thanks so much for <laughs> taking that big question and uh, and answering it in a record amount of time. That's super cool. A question I <laughs> really want to ask you is a bit more globally. What would you say is your field's like biggest question right now? Like the one you'd like the answer to before you die? That's a big question, but <laughs> yeah. I guess one that's uh, on my mind a lot is in the world of machine learning, what is the place for Bayesian methods? So I sort of came up in a period when the Bayesian methodology star was uh, was ascendant in machine learning. Mm -hmm. And since then, of course, deep learning has uh, really taken over. And I think one of the questions that I would like an answer to is like, at the end of the day, in like 
10 or 20 years, are we going to be using Bayesian methods for these perceptual tasks, for these language modeling tasks? Mm -hmm. Is there really a place for really Bayesian methods in that context? Or is it all just going to be giant models that are fit with SGD, right? Like, I think there's a strong argument to be made that if you're, the Bayesian framework is good for dealing with limited amounts of data in a principled way. Some of these perceptual domains, it doesn't feel like there's a limited amount of data. It feels like the reason that we are limited is not because we have finite data, but because we have finite computational resources, mm-hmm. right? Like there's, you know, there are exceptions, certainly, but for for things like, you know, speech recognition or image classification, that sort of thing, right? I mean, maybe there are these tail classes or something like that where you don't have a ton of data. But as far as just like learning a machine for extracting features from images, like we have enough images. There's no posterior uncertainty that's coming from Bayes' rule about what that representation should look like. You know, the the uncertainty is just because we can't run SGD for long enough. And so does Bayes have anything to say in that context? Does it have something to say about like fine tuning these large models? Does it have something to say, or does it have something to say, like, I mean, certainly, like, I believe that Bayesian statistical thinking is a, you know, it's a relatively late achievement for human beings, right? But it's an achievement, and it's it's important, but humanity got by fine without it for a long, long time, uh, depending on your definition of fine, of course. But, like, if our goal is just, like, human level of intelligence at the level of, like, you know, medieval peasant or something like that, right? Like they didn't understand Bayesian statistics, like they could, but they could under, you know, but they could shoe a horse or whatever, right? Like they could do all kinds of things that robots can't do yet. So I don't know. I mean, I think there's definitely a place for at least approximate Bayesian methods when you start getting to higher level reasoning. Like, you know, that's sort of the level that the cognitive scientists sort of talk about, right? Is like, decision-making under uncertainty and rationality and and so on and so forth, right? And like, even you can study animal behavior and show that like, they, you know, behave in ways that that, that sort of like, relate to Bayes' rule somehow, but it's not at the low-level perceptual system. It's not the level of their low-level perceptual systems, right? Presumably, it's somewhere a little above that. So I guess I'd like to know what level this is going to be important, and also like, whether or not, in the long run, we're going to be able to approximate the optimal Bayesian algorithm well enough with just like a big transformer or something. And so we shouldn't like all of this uh, sort of separation principle stuff is nice, but it introduces a bunch of approximation bias because our priors are wrong or are, or we're not learning them properly, or we're using too restrictive of a set of assumptions or whatever. And we'd be better off just sort of doing something end to end. That's sort of the hypothesis that I would really like to have. Yeah, I guess I would be, I would be comfortable making much stronger prognostications about the future of the field if I really had a strong opinion about that hypothesis. But as it is, I, I really, you know, I don't know. I see. Interesting. A bit grim, but interesting. It depends on your perspective, right? It's uh, like, I don't think Bayesian stats are going away. Again, it's, you know, this is a, this is an, statistical thinking is an important achievement and, you know, we should be proud of it. It's just, it might not be the way that robots decide how to pick up delicate objects. Yeah, we'll see about that. <laughs> but, and, and by the way, on that front, like, quite clear to, on that future of patient stance, like, what's something you, like, you'd really like to see and something you really, you would really not like to see? Yeah, like I said, you know, I'd like to see a future where things are simpler, mm-hmm. where, where some of this friction has gone away, where we kind of know how to think about, it would be great to, like, have better best practices on prior elicitation, I think, in complicated models. Certainly people are thinking about that, but I think we've got a lot more thinking to do. Not to and we have a lot more thing to do both in terms of, you know, what those best practices actually are and also how we communicate them. Because of course, right, that's like where I'd really like things to get is to a place where Bayesian hierarchical Bayesian modeling is as kind of easy for people to get started with and make like real progress with as deep learning is. Again, some of this is colored by my experience at Google, but like, you know, Google has done a great job of training software engineers with, you know, limited, I mean, you know, math backgrounds, but but really computer science backgrounds at training them to train huge neural networks to solve problems to the point where like, you know, you don't need a machine learning specialist anymore to do that. And the reason I think that that has worked as well as it has is both because you know, the framework can kind of deliver what it promises, but also because 
the formalism is simple enough and easy enough to communicate that the people can get started and actually do something without kind of years of training. So I think we've got work to do as far as figuring out how to make that, how to make these methods more accessible, you know, given a formalism that is fundamentally a little bit more complicated than just like there is a circuit and you do gradient, dis there, there's a differentiable circuit and it has inputs and outputs and we want the outputs to be correct for the inputs. You know, I think there's definitely also a need for software tools. Like, I don't think that's going to happen without better software tools. And, you know, figuring out kind of what is the level at which those software tools need to be customizable, I think, is uh, is an important one. You know, like we're spending, uh, our group is spending a lot of time talking with uh, Vikash Mansinka at MIT these days. And, and he certainly has very strong opinions about these uh, these questions. That's been really, I think, helpful for uh, for me to kind of as a, as a way of spending more time thinking about these things. You know, I don't think, but yeah, I, I think that's also, right. I mean, there's a bunch of cool stuff going on in probabilistic programming, but I don't think we have kind of the, I think we're still very much exploring kind of what is the, yeah, what are the workflows and what is the software, what are the software tools that enable that? And, you know, maybe even what are the hardware tools that enable that? That does sound cool. I like that feature. Cool. Well, I have one really small last question from Colin Carroll, who I think you know, and he asked me to ask you, why do the samplers you work on have food-based names? Like nuts, cheese, meads. Is that on purpose? Are you hungry, Matt? Oh, yeah, I guess that, I guess they do. Huh. How yeah. No, of course, that was intentional. Yes. You know, it started with, with nuts, of course, right? And that um, the no U-turn thing was actually uh, one, of Bob Car one of Bob Carpenter's suggestions. Which, uh, which I really, you know, really liked. I thought it was, uh, you know, very nice, evocative kind of, uh, kind I of love term. It. And of course, no U-turn just like falls right out of there. So that was, you know, that was the, the beginning. And then we were working on this project to try and, you know, so there was this issue with nuts where it turned out to be just like a huge pain to get to be performant on a GPU. And so we're like, well, okay, maybe there's something else we could do, which turned, which eventually got to cheese, but originally was a little bit different. And then the earlier version, there was an earlier version called Tater. And in, in any case, the, the name was sort of like meant to reference nuts in the sense of being like, if your GPU has a has a nut allergy or a nuts allergy, then, uh, you know, because it just like sort of slows down and puffs up, I guess, if you uh, if you try and get it to run nuts, then uh, then you could try this uh, this other high density food item and hopefully it won't... Uh, be allergic to that. <laughs> so that was tater, and then and then eventually cheese, uh, which was sort of the the improved tater. And then you know, two is uh, once you've got two things, that's a pattern, and uh, and it gets its own momentum, so to speak. So that's uh, it took. Uh, yeah, actually, meads meads took a little while. It was uh, that took some thinking to get to to get that particular backronym. Yeah, I, I can guess that. <laughs> cool. Oh, uh, all right. That's super cool. Thanks a lot for for taking so much time, Matt. Um, I really enjoyed it. And of course, thank you. As usual, before letting you go, though, I'm going to ask you the, the last two questions. I ask every guest at the end of the show. So first one, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? Well, I mean, that's obviously a big if. So, you know, given unlimited time and resources, I think I would probably try and solve, you know, the, the biggest problem, which is moral philosophy, right? Like, you know, that's... You know, you have a, you have responsibility given unlimited time and resources to do the right thing, but of course we don't really know what the right thing is. But given unlimited time and resources, maybe I could figure it out and succeed where thousands of years of uh, of human thinkers have have failed. But like unlimited time means like you know possibly millions of years is how I'm interpreting that question. Or you know maybe just try and crack like you know climate change or or space exploration, so one, you know, one of those ensuring the sur uh, survival of humanity kind of things. But it's a, obviously a, a big if. <laughs> yeah, of course, but that was the question. And second question, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, or fictional, who would it be? So that's also a, also a big if, but uh, I guess, I don't know, maybe like one of the Ghostbusters? <laughs> you know, Venkman is, is obviously an, an, an obvious choice, but I guess if you're if you're talking about like scientific minds, probably Spengler or, or maybe Stance would be the the uh, the better choice. Mm -hmm. Donatello, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, is also true. Also, uh, also maybe a, a good one. He seems like you know, living or dead. Yeah, living or dead people, like actual human beings, is uh, obviously a little 
more restricted, but uh, I don't know, maybe von Neumann. Oh, yeah. seems, like a, seems like he was a smart guy by all accounts. True. Oh, yeah, that'd be fun. I think you're the second one. I think yesterday I interviewed neuroscientist Pascal Wallish, and I think he said uh, John von Neumann too. So, yeah, like now these dinner is getting crowded. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. And um, I think Bob Cap. Carpenter. So I interviewed him for, I just interviewed him for, for an episode. I think he told me you play heavy metal guitar. Is that true? That is true. Nice. Nice. So, um, if you want a, a challenge, you can, you can, uh, take the theme song of the podcast, Good Bayesian, and turn it into some heavy metal guitar stuff. If you do that though, like tell me and we'll definitely put that for the theme song of your episode. Like that I really <laughs> love that. All right. I'm not sure how quickly I can turn that around, but uh I'll, I'll take a look. You have some time before your episode is is hitting the press. So you know I, I'm just giving you a musical challenge. You do what you want. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well I think it's time to call it a show. Thanks a lot, Matt. Yeah, I learned a lot. Uh, still a lot of things I didn't understand because samplers, just lots of math. I have to read the papers over and over again and then ask a lot of questions to mainly Ad Adrian Zabolt and Luciano Pass inside the, Pi inside the PIMC team, Jun Peng Lao also and, and Colin Carroll. But with time and determination, I'm going to, I'm going there. So <laughs> thanks a lot. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, well, I put resources and a link to your website in the show notes. We definitely need to put the, the links to your papers in the show notes for the people who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, Matt, for taking the time and being on this show. My pleasure. Thank you. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn base stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good base and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good base and change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation.